everybody. Welcome to this baby we call The Sweat, a program we bring you here on DraftKings Network and VEASAN every Saturday and Sunday morning from 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock Eastern Time. I am your host for the next two hours, Mr. Emerson Lazio, sitting alongside Mr. Steve Buchanan. Happy Easter to you, my friend. Oh, it is right, great yeah. to see you here. Great spring colors on you today. The two most consistent guys on this show is at this desk right now. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe... Julian Edlow, when he joins us here in the second hour to break down some Elite Eight bets, he will no longer be in his Vegas hotel room and could quite possibly be inside a studio. What Although else? I did, I did enjoy looking at his satin pillow in the background. That yeah. was a nice little touch. He also side texted me and told me he was just wearing that button down. He had no pants on, just a button down <laughs> shirt. Mike Pritchard, by the way, speaking of VEASAN, because that's where Julian will be in our VEASAN studios out in Las Vegas. Mike Pritchard is going to stop by. So which NFL team totals he likes here? Plus, there we go. you know, a guy who was taken in the first round of the NFL draft a couple of decades ago. He's going to break down some of the top prospects, maybe which quarterback is most intriguing to him. He really likes the team that took him in the first round of the pick back in the early 90s, the Atlanta Falcons, dude, mm. who have the second highest win total, shockingly, in the NFL, plus the highest rated segment in this show's history. Correct. Put up your buke. That's you right. and Gary are going to go toe to toe, bout for bout, punch for punch. Talking DFS here, helping people build a money-making lineup on the diamond, which is where we're going to start. We're going to step inside the batter's box here because the first Sunday of the Major League Baseball season and the last day of March are shaking hands here. Before we get into today's bets, yeah. Steve, a little bit of reaction here. We're about three days in, some teams just two days into the season. But yesterday, a couple things standing out here. One to me. The Orioles have smashed the Angels here Again. for the first two games of their season, which now L.A. has set a record for earliest team meeting right. to start a season here. Ron Washington, the new manager for the Angels, had to get the boys together and say, hey, listen. It's a long season. We're only two games in. We got 160 more to go. Let's not get off track here. That's kind of sad, Steve, if you ask me. <laughs> Take a deep breath. I mean, Ron Washington has had a fantastic managerial career. He's like 95 years old, of course. And for whatever reason, he's like, you know what? I'm going to give the Angels a shot here. I'm going to go from, you know, coaching in Texas from all those years ago. Going to give the Angels a shot. After the second game of the season, <laughs> we're holding a team meeting already. Like, we knew this Angels team was going to be bad. But we did not expect them to have only scored seven runs through the first two games and then allow 24 already to the Baltimore Orioles, which is a very potent offense, still very much alive for the race to 10 wins, which we'll be watching as the week goes on. But my lord, mm -hmm. second game of the season to basically tell this team, hey, this doesn't have to be the tone of the season. We can still turn it around, which they won't. But bless this guy's heart, truly. He should be at home. On his porch, maybe he's got a farmer's porch, got a nice swing oh, out I there. Love it. Or like a rocking chair, a yeah. homemade rocking chair with your initials carved in it. Enjoy that nice summer breeze. Oh. He could be doing next to nothing, but he chose love it. to manage the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, who just look like could be one of the worst teams. I can't remember the timing of it. Did he officially take over the job? After no, he did it before Shohei officially announced that he was going to the Dodgers too. So maybe yeah, he because he was hired in November. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. maybe he was thinking, you know what? You're telling <laughs> there me, was no telling shot. me there's a chance. There maybe, was no maybe shot Shohei anyways. sticks around, but he's like, hey, at least we got Mike Trout. Yeah, yeah who knows? <laughs> Could be some trade bait uh, coming down the road. Anything else stand out to you uh, yesterday around Major League Baseball? Uh, uh, Pirates are just continue to be a wagon, man. Pirates three and zero already on the season, looking good so far. Uh, that's going to be a team to watch. Them and the Reds are going to be really fun team in that NL Central. Yeah, those are the teams that you've been yeah. uh, pushing a lot here in the preseason with that young talent teams to keep an eye on when it comes to betting on the DK Sportsbook. Speaking of that, let's go back to the O's here. So one of nine teams remaining unbeaten in Major yep. League Baseball, and you're targeting them here in the totals department today. Can you tell me why? Yeah, we're going to go over four and a half runs for the Orioles today going up against that Angels team once again, and uh, specifically Reed Detmers. Like we just mentioned here, the Orioles have been just piling on the runs against the Angels so far in these two games. 24 runs scored in the first two games, and a lot of that has come against this Angels bullpen. They have only played two games, and they have already covered all 
already 14 and two thirds innings that this bullpen has had to pitch so far. Now they have another game here against the Orioles. You got Reed Detmers, like I mentioned, going for the Angels here today. Mainly a fastball and slider pitcher. Two pitches that the Angels, uh, excuse me, the Orioles have handled quite well over the past year or so. Coming into this game against the Orioles, this should be another offense-heavy game for this Orioles team going against the le lefty Reed Detmers. Give me the Orioles over four and a half runs here today. First Sunday night baseball game of the year is going to have Dodger Blue yep. all over it. You're going to be seeing a lot of it tonight on national yes. television, which, hey, some of us here were wise enough to bet Cardinals money line yesterday, and that came through against the Dodgers here. And yeah. you're going back to the well, and you're betting the total here for the Dodgers. Uh, yes, I mean, I want to make it perfectly clear. I did not advise you to bet the Cardinals. No, I no, never no. I would just, have advised you to bet the Cardinals. I said I you had were, a, I You went aggressive have, on your own. I said I had a bonus bet, and after what we saw with Yamamoto in the preseason, although Yamamoto yesterday wasn't the issue. Well, yeah, five shutout innings against the Cardinals. I would hope so. I would hope so. But anyways, we're going to take the Dodgers over four and a half runs here. Uh, this is probably going to get to five and a half by the time first pitch rolls around. So if you want to, if you don't mind paying a little bit of extra juice and getting that little bit of a lower number, you can get four four and a half now. Uh, but through five games this season, the Dodgers, of course, played those two, two games in South Korea. They're already averaging 6.8 runs per game. Like, this offense has been an absolute wagon already to start the year, as expected. They haven't scored less than five runs in any of the five games that they've played so far this season. That bullpen for the Cardinals, kind of like the Angels, has already been taxed already. That bullpen has already had to cover 12 and two-thirds innings so far in this series in the three games that these two teams have played already. These Dodgers bats are going to yeah. be good against lefties despite them having a lot of lefties in this lineup already. You got Betts, you got Will Smith, Freeman who hits lefties very well. Teoscar Hernandez who hits lefties very well. Going up against Steven Matz here in prime time. I think this is going to be a nice short outing here for Steven Matz who really, once he gets runners on base, really kind of falls apart. His numbers have followed him in that type of scenario throughout his career with the Dodgers, with the way that they get guys on base. This should be a short outing for Steven Matz. Give me over four and a half runs. The Dodgers won't win every game this year, but you will find good prices betting against them at some point. Sure. This does not feel like the spot to do no, it. No, not at all. As we go to game bet, which one stands out to you for this first Sunday of the season? Yeah, I like taking the Rangers on the money line here, going up against the Cubs. The Rangers are taking on Jordan Wicks, who was a lefty for the Cubs, made his MLB debut last year, pitched about seven or eight games, uh, but has a rotation spot here so far this season. Last season, the Texas Rangers just absolutely dismantled left-handed pitching. 341 Warbur against them, 115 WRC plus going against lefties. Wicks is a lefty who had some really good strikeout numbers in the minors, but at least in the short stint that we've seen him up in the majors, those strikeout numbers have not translated at all to the majors. He's inducing a lot more contact than he did in the minors. He had just a 6.2 K9 in the majors last year, which is way below a batter per inning, while in the Miners, he was striking out, had a K9 of like 11 and 10 for the couple years that he was in the major. So this is a big difference here for Wicks. So if you're looking for contact as a lefty going up against the Rangers, that is just a recipe for disaster, my friends. For the Rangers, they have John Gray going up. For them, after a really bad month of September, that really kind of skewed his numbers. So it looks like his season wasn't as great as it actually was. But he was a pretty admirable and reliable starter for him in the middle of that rotation. Going up against the Cubs here today. Today, I do like the Rangers a lot because I think they're really going to get to Wicks early. That should give them enough for the lead. Getting them at minus 135 feels yeah. like a pretty reasonable number, so give me the Rangers on the money line here today. And by the way, getting close to that minus 140 money line number there, Texas had a record of 46 and 27 in games yeah. played as a money line favorite with odds of minus 140 or shorter last year. So 63% yep. win percentage there. And also, shout out to Corey Seager. Yesterday, four-hit game there. Oh, he's couple, just amazing. Couple he's RBI amazing. Driven, uh, driven in there. And you mentioned on this show multiple times already, too, the numbers he put up last year were incredible considering he had only played, like... If he had played the full complement of games, like, he easily could have been the MVP of yes. the American League. His numbers were just absurd. And just real quick note on the Rangers, too, as well. Okay. They were the best team on the run line last year. So if you want to take that route as well, get plus money on that run line, you can take a look at that as well. All right, well, speaking of dudes <clears throat> who can hit... And swing good wood here. Yeah. What do you have for a hitter prop on today's slate? Yeah, Jordan Alvarez to go over one and a half bases. You're getting that at a very reasonable minus 105 here today uh, in his matchup. Uh, if you look at his numbers, uh, 
just against righties. He had a 387 Woba, 150 WRC plus against righties at home last year. This is a matchup that he absolutely smashed in. Going up against Clark Schmidt of the Yankees here. Had some really poor numbers against lefties. 376 Woba, 485 FIP. Only a 7.6 K9. So he's striking out less than a batter per inning. Getting a lot more contact against lefties. And 10 of the 24 home runs he allowed. Those numbers got even worse away from Yankee Stadium. 390 Woba against lefties last year. If you look at Alvarez, he was somebody that went over that one and a half bases mark more than half of the season. 61 of the 114 games he played, he went over one and a half bases. You're getting this close to plus money here going up against Clark Schmidt. I love this spot here for Jordan Alvarez and the Astros overall. I think this is a good spot for both guys, but specifically like Alvarez at minus 105. I think at one point he was favored to lead mm -hmm the league and runs batted in this season. I think you're correct, or he yeah. was second. He was definitely yeah, around was, that realm. He was up there big time. All right, good stuff. We'll do the DFS thing with Gary and uh, for Put Up Your Bukes coming up here in a second. Uh, right now, we got to take a 180-second break, folks. We're taking a trip down memory lane with former first-round pick Mike Pritchard, our VSIN teammate, plus NFL win totals that catch his football-loving eye. Everybody diving deep into some NFL storylines with a man who played on Sundays, a first round draft pick back in 1991, our v teammate, Mr. Mike Pritchard. How you been, Mike? I've been excellent, Emerson. Enjoying the offseason so far, although it's quick, fast, and in a hurry right now. I mean, we're, we're not too far from the NFL draft, which is crazy to think about. It is crazy to think about, and it's kind of crazy to also think about 
Some of these rule changes the owners signed off on during the NFL annual meeting, which change do you like the most? I think the kickoff and then the hip drop tackle got the most traction on social media. Yeah, it really did, which uh, is incredible. I mean, defensive players, they're going to continue to complain, right? <laughs> I mean, these guys are getting fined left and right, and now you're taking tackling out of it, uh, certain tackles away from them. Uh, but, you know, I stay away from my legs. You know, as an offensive yep. player, I hate I hate it when guys would attack my legs uh, for no reason, right? You know, hit me up high. Let me protect myself. Let me see the hit coming, or if I don't see it coming, uh, at least I'm padded up. Uh, right. But if you go after my knees, if you if you drop your weight uh, and swivel around and land on my legs, that's never a good situation. I mean, that's an ACL. That's that's meniscus. I mean, that's a lot of issues, broken leg, broken bones. Uh, and so I, I like that, you know, defense players go ahead and continue to complain. Go on to the offensive side of the ball uh, where the where real players are at. Um, I, I like I like the best rule that I like. I mean, the kickoff is a joke to me uh, really? as they as they still. Yeah, they still tinker with it. I, I think it's a joke. Um, uh, it, I, I don't know if it even looks right. Uh, well, yeah, see. I mean, there, you, when you got to go to the XFL to grab right. to grab an idea, it's going to look a little different. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but I get it. I, I mean, I, I played in a day when um, you got rewarded for breaking up a wedge. Can you imagine? That was instant concussion back then, too, uh -huh. by the way. Uh, now for that's sure. completely out the game, which it should be. I mean, that, that was uh, barbaric. Um, but I, I think, um, um, you know, the best rule that I like uh, is, it, is, it, is, the, um, is the independent official. Mm. And nobody's really talking about this, but the independent official or the, the replay assistant, right? Um, they can get involved in rush, uh, roughing the passer calls now. Uh, they can overturn those situations in which the judgment is flat out wrong uh, by the officials. So I love that. Uh, no more hockey uh, a, a game anymore. Uh, but he's a verb now, by the way. Yeah. But no, I, I love the fact that the, the NFL and, and the replay assistant can get involved uh, and, and overturn some some okay. really uh, over officious calls out there. They can use that hockeling uh, verb there in the <laughs> gym as well, because that's the most absolute jacked referee we've ever seen in the, in the history <laughs> right, of officials. Right. Hey, big news this week, too. We had win totals drop on the DK Sportsbook. Mm -hmm. One team that jumps out to everybody is the team that took you in the first round a few decades ago there, man. You have the Falcons now with quarterback Kirk Cousins under center, a hefty 10.5 win total, just right under three teams sitting at 11.5. What's your outlook here on Atlanta? Yeah, you know, Emerson, I thought they could get to 10 wins uh, this past season, um, to be honest with you. And that was a, a situation with Arthur Arthur Smith and, uh, you know, the quarterback uh, situation, too. But uh, you look at the young talent that they have offensively and then defensively, they were coming along as well. Uh, just didn't get it done. Um, the division is always in flux. Uh, I, I think that's an opportunity, certainly, for the Falcons that way. Uh, when you look at uh, the quarterback situation, I mean, Kirk Cousins... Uh, <sighs> He's not Lamar Jackson, right? I mean, I, I think Arthur Blank, if he would have went after Lamar Jackson, that would have made everybody happy if you were back in the Falcons. Uh, you, you can back the Falcons to a certain extent. I still have questions about Raheem Morris uh, and, and you know, certainly Kirk Cousins and, and, and fitting in uh, down there. That, that is lofty, but uh, there's a chance for it to come in. Uh, because of the fact that that division is just so in flux, and it always is. Yeah, and people must agree with you because that total's now been bet down to nine and a half. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, um, I mean that's some know, talent, Kirk, Mike. Uh, there's you, a lot of talent there. Uh, I mean, look, I think about it. London, you, you got Pitts. Bijan. Um, Bijan. Yeah. And then also the type of offense that they're running. They're running the Shanahan offense. And uh, just look at the Super Bowl. Um, we, we had the, the West Coast offense heavily represented in, in the playoffs this past offseason, over this past season. Uh, and now you're seeing more and more teams going to um, the Shanahan version or certainly the West Coast, a version of the West Coast offense is quarterback friendly uh, and is certainly friendly for a lot of the great playmakers that they have on offense. OK, any other win totals stand out to you that became available on the DK Sportsbook and, and maybe any ones that you think we should hop on now? Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at New England. Um, what is it? Plus 130 under four and a half. Now, that, that's crazy to think about, right? right? But, but think about the whole brain trust is different now. 
um, Bill Belichick was a GM slash head coach. I mean, it was a complete culture uh, with Belichick there. Now you switch over to Mayo, uh, and also now you have a GM. Uh, and I don't know how that's going to go. You know, nobody knows how that's going to go. And, and then you got to make it work on, on the field with a new quarterback if they go that route. Uh, I, I think it's a complete remake of that situation, that entire team. Uh, and a, co- a very competitive division, too, and a very competitive conference with the AFC. So uh, plus 130, minus four and a half. I mean, I, I think it could get there. Uh, there's a lot of excitement about the Bears, too. Uh, eight and a half. I like the roster, but you got a new coordinator. You're going to have a new quarterback. We've seen this story so many times. And lofty expectations, what, eight and a half. Uh, under that's plus 115. So I've been eyeing that as well. And I know prospects... They're starting to just make headlines consistently day in and day out as we get closer to the NFL draft uh, next month here, Mike. Did you have a pro day? Because we've just seen pro days uh, galore all over the place this past week. And and what what was that experience like for you? Yeah, you know what, Emerson? It was crazy. So um, I had uh, the combine. uh, And the combine typically is um, confirmation and discovery. Right. And, and I was in that realm where um, they discovered me a little bit because of the season that I had my senior year. Uh, and then they wanted to confirm what they were seeing. And certainly uh, the confirmation came with it because I had a, I had a pretty good combine. But uh, back then I didn't have one single pro day. Um, I had 22 auditions for <laughs> uh, for the 28 teams at, at the time. So uh, basically what happened uh, is my agent would get in touch with me uh, during the course of the day and. Uh, say, look, you, we got so-and-so teams in uh, in town. They want to work you out. Uh, and can you get there to the facility uh, there at CU on campus uh, and work out after classes? So I, I typically would work out every day of the week uh, for a team or, or several teams that would come into town uh, and, and, and certainly the teams that were interested in me. So I, I had about 22 pro days, uh, to be honest with you. I think I, think I ran, I, I want to say over eight 40s and uh, <laughs> I had to work out uh, for for various teams that were in town. So I, I wish we would have had one organized pro day. That would that would have made a lot of things uh, a lot of things easier for me back then. And I know wide receivers, your bread and butter here. We're in the golden age of those guys. What do you think about this class this year, Marvin Harrison Jr. and other studs? Who these guys just keep getting faster and faster and faster. I mean, where do you think the strength of this wide receiver class ranks among some of the strong ones we've seen in recent memory? Yeah, I mean, you got to go back what to the '80s and uh, look at '88 with Michael Irvin and, and and Tim Brown. I mean, you can go to '96, uh, which was an incredible class, They're probably the, the best class when you think about To and uh, Keyshawn and yeah. all these guys. Um, you know, the right receiver position is going to be deeper and deeper each and every year. I've been saying this uh, on VEASAN uh, for a number of years. If you think about all the youth camps that are out there right now, uh, you got all these quarterback camps, you got the Manning camp and all these guys, but all these receivers are popping up too uh, in the in in the summer uh, on all these passing leagues. And I'm yeah. talking about from the youth camps. Uh, so they're working on their skills, uh, developing that confidence, running routes, uh, and certainly the speed is there too. And uh, I, it's going to get saturated at some point. But right now, there's so many younger wide receivers coming through the, the pipeline uh, that it's just going to make the league just that much more dif- uh, 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 dangerous, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, you think about some of these athletes that are on that side of the ball, they're, they're trying to switch them to the defensive side of the ball uh, because they're so fast, they're so gifted. Instead of playing wide receiver, you can make a ton of money Uh, if you go to the defense side of the ball and cover these type of receivers. So we're seeing that too. I mean, that that position is just becoming more and more athletic. It's getting lengthy. Everybody's long. Everybody can run and jump and uh, very, very athletic out there on the perimeter right now in the NFL. Mike, we got about a minute to go here, but which of these top quarterbacks, maybe outside Caleb Williams, are you most intrigued by? You know, um, I'm most intrigued by JJ. Um, I I think because he's coming from a, a, a... pro offense in college and now if you look on tape and if you watch him confirmation right uh it kind of looks the part um go back to that 2021 class that was so horrible so god awful uh and, and i think uh teams are scared of that you know over drafting guys so they want the sure thing if they can get it i i am intrigued by him um 
Yeah. You know, Caleb Williams, I, I, I think he's got a lot of poise. I, I know Merrill Hodge came out strong against him. Uh, but but he's a franchise quarterback in, in the making and, and certainly has to get to the right situation. All right, Mike, it was great catching up with you. Great having you on. Hopefully uh, we see you once again draft time just about a month away. We will see Steve Buchanan and Gary and Thorne once again after this break. They're going to put up their bukes. So prepare yourself for a happy, healthy DFS debate. If you're looking to build a money-making baseball lineup on this fine Easter Sunday, Ooh. hell yeah, brother. This is the segment for you. So back by popular demand. Correct. It's Put Up Your Bukes, the highest-rated segment in this show's long historic history because our sweet 
Canadian Saint Gary and Thorne is half the battle here. So kind to get up early on this Sunday. Good morning, Muffin Man. How are you? I don't know how I feel about being called Muffin Man, but aside from that, doing yeah. pretty well. Yeah, that wasn't very nice. Well, when I give you an adorable nickname like that, it's because you mean something to me, Gary. And so for anyone new to this segment, Steve gives his top DFS plays at each position here. Garion either agrees with him like a coward or puts, up, or puts up his bukes. I know you never do. And then he will tell Steve why he is wrong and terrible. So right now, bukes, let's start on Das Bump. Hook me up with your pitcher du jour in DFS today. Yeah, I like this spot a lot for uh, Trevor Rogers over with the Marlins. Uh -huh. You know, it's easy to forget how good of a season this guy had two years ago. Last year, dealing with some injuries, some pretty poor play overall. Strikeout numbers were still there, but we're starting a new season now. This is 2024. We're going to give this guy the benefit of the doubt and say that maybe he can get back to his old form. And is it a good spot to do here against the Pirates? Now, the Pirates, as we mentioned at the top of the show, have been an absolute wagon so far. 3-0 to start the year, going up against the lowly Marlins. But that being said, you look at the numbers that Rogers posted a couple of years ago. 2.64 ERA, 3.37 expected ERA, 10.6 K9. And that's kind of the key components here. The Pirates, for as good as they've been so far, are going to struggle against left-handed pitching throughout the season. Here. We kind of saw that already when they faced Jesus Lazardo on opening day there. He gave up just two runs on two hits, eight strikeouts to five innings of work in that start here. You look at this roster overall as a whole against lefties, 307 Woba, 24% K rate, and just an 89 WRC plus last year. That lineup we saw last year, essentially the same as what we're seeing here this year. So give me Rogers at a pretty affordable $8,600 going against the Pirates. The name Jesus is very popular today, Stephen. Garion, <laughs> talk to me, Goose. Stupid. What, are, <laughs> what are you thinking here? Put up your bukes. Yeah, I'm going full psychological warfare against Steve on this one. Uh, Tyler Wells is my option at $8,300. And it's in Steve and my own best interest that Tyler Wells pitches well today and wins this game. Because as we all know, the Orioles will be the first team in baseball to 10 wins this season. Uh, I like this guy. I like it a lot. I like this guy. There we go. Care Bear. But Tyler Wells, on his own, pretty good pitcher last season. I think pitched above expectations, we could probably say. Maybe not someone who was destined to be in this rotation. Injuries have kind of kept him in the fold for Baltimore, at least at the start of the season. But 25% strikeout rate as a starter, that is well above average. Over a strikeout per inning, 109 strikeouts in 108.1 innings pitched as a starter last season. Someone who pitched much better in Baltimore as well. That's key. Tyler Wells has struggled with the home run ball. 2.25 home runs per nine on the road. That number goes way down in Baltimore with that lovely, spacious left field for pitchers to work with. 3.39 uh, ERA in 2023 pitching at home for the Orioles. We know the Angels stink. Maybe Mike Trout hits a solo home run. That's like the, the entirety of their <laughs> offense at this point. Mm. So Tyler Wells can probably survive that. I think he has a really solid game and has a very high win expectancy on this slate. Death taxes and Mike Trout hitting a solo home run and then the Angels losing by like eight or nine <laughs> runs. And having a team meeting. Yeah. All right. <laughs> wow. Gary and Thorne, that was uh, history there. Yeah. Wells, by the way, I think wasn't he slayed to start the season in the bullpen? Then a couple injuries kind of forced him in for, as, yep. the, uh, yep. as the fourth starter there. Kind of a fantasy sleeper if you ask some experts. All right. Next up, Steve, what do we got? Yeah, so we're going to go in the infield here. We're going to go with uh, my guy, Josh Young, going up against a lefty today with the Texas Rangers. He was an absolute beast last year going up against left-handed pitching. 418 Wolver and a 168 WRC plus in those matchups against Southpaws last year. We talked about this earlier in the show. I like the Rangers today against the Cubs going up against Jordan Wicks, who, to his credit, has a very big pitch arsenal. Includes a changeup, fastball, sinker. All three of those pitches combined, combined go for 78% of the pitches he throws. Josh Young hits all of those pitches well. You look at his numbers last year, he had 293 against the changeup, 
292 against the fastball, and 325 against the sinker last year. So if you put all those pitches together, go up against, uh, you know, Josh Jung here if you're Jordan Wicks, there really isn't much that you can throw him that he wasn't able to handle last year. So you take all that into account, take how good he was against lefties last year, feels like a really good spot for Josh Jung. Like I mentioned in the top of the show, like the Rangers today on the money line, minus 135 going against the Cubs. That's a pretty reasonable number and a matchup that they really should handle against Wicks. So give me Jung at third base here for the infield. Garyan, you always put up your bukes in this segment, so have at it. Something tells me you're sticking with the Crab Cake Brigade. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Tyler Wells needs some run support to get that win, right? Uh, Ryan Mountcastle, who, I mean, God, it, two or three seasons now where if the Orioles are facing a left-handed pitcher, Mountcastle is going to be underpriced. It used to be in the 3K to 4K range. You got to pay a little bit more now. He's $4,300, but he had a 474 expected WOBA against left-handed pitching last season. No qualified player in the American League posted a better mark within that split. You could argue he is one of the best hitters of left-handed pitching in all of baseball. Reed Detmers is fine. I really have nothing too negative to say about him. Did have an ERA above five on the road, so struggled pitching outside of Los Angeles last season. But again, this is mainly about the price tag on a guy who absolutely crushes within this split. So give me Mount Castle against the lefty today. And Bukes, as we make our way to the outfield, your pick makes all the sense in the world after you were Thanks. tooting his horn a little bit when we stepped into the betters box to open the show. Yeah, so we took Jordan Alvarez to go over one and a half bases. So if I'm going to be using that as a bet, might as well use him in my fantasy lineup too as well, going up against Clark Schmidt. For whatever reason, the Astros are having a hard time handling the New York Yankees, who have started off the season with a 3-0 and record. Incredible. After today, it will be 3-1. and one. Oh. JP France cools off those Yankee bats, and Clark Schmidt gets annihilated by this Astros lineup. Schmidt was absolutely t -t -t tortured against lefties last year. You like that? Today, like that Junior. One, 376 Wolver against him, 4.85 FIP, only a 7.6 K9 against lefties. So he's striking out less than a batter per inning when he's facing southpaws, 10 of the 24 home runs that he allowed on the season as well. Even worse on the road, 390 Woba on the road against lefties. Obviously, this game is being played in Houston. Alvarez had a 387 Woba last year and a 150 WRC plus against righties at home. This has been a great spot for him here. Obviously, he has a ton of power that he can use against Clark Schmidt. As I mentioned, he gave up 24 home runs last year. Alvarez is a bit pricey. He's one of the most expensive uh, uh uh, outfields on this slate here at 5,700. But that being said, this is a great spot for him going up against Clark Schmidt. And with the Atlanta Braves basking in the early season success they're having over the Phillies, wounds seem to have scarred over from the last year. So Gary and Thorne says, okay, I'll see your Alvarez, and I'll raise you the highest-priced outfielder on today's slate. You know, if you get a chance to use Ronald Acuna Jr., just use Ronald Acuna Jr., uh, arguably the best player in all of DFS. I mean, he can do it in a myriad of ways. Obviously, he can put the ball over the fence. Could just steal four bases today. Who knows how Ronald Acuna Jr. is going to put up his massive DFS total, but he will do it in this matchup against Ranger Suarez. Again, Suarez, not a bad left-handed pitcher, but he is a left-handed pitcher. And I mentioned how good Ryan Mountcastle was mm. in terms of expected WOBA against left-handed pitching last season. The only player better at 475 was Ronald Acuna Jr. It's another thing that he did better than everyone else in baseball last season. He's already off to a hot start. He's five for nine. He's got a walk. He's got a stolen base. Checks all the boxes. I don't have to explain it too much. He's the reigning National League MVP. Give me Acuna. All right. Well, this is going to be important then when we talk value considering the amount of money that you two have spent in other positions. Steve, value play du jour here. Yes, yeah, so we're going to go over to the Mets Ooh, for this that's one been here. It's a spicy series to open here, too. It has. I don't know what's going on. Like, we're like three I, games I love into it. the season, and they want to like throw haymakers. You, you need more fights in baseball. And real real quick, the slide by Hoskins, totally illegal. I don't know what Jeff McNeil's, but belly Yeah, everyone's a little emotional. He's being days. a little, you know what. Yeah. Uh, but Brett Beatty. Brett Beatty at 3K going up against Colin Ray. Colin Ray really struggles against lefties. 346 Wova, 6.08 FIP on the year against him. 15 of the 23 home runs that he allows. Uh, he throws an almost nothing but fastball, some form of a fastball, 76% of the time. Beatty can handle the fastball. Six of his eight home runs last year came off those pitches. Give me Brett Beatty at 3K. Gary, you got about 15, 20 seconds here. 
Just going to go with Matt Wallner. He's super cheap, less than $3,000. Fantastic bat going up against right-handed pitching as a lefty. Going to hit fifth or sixth in that Twins lineup. 281 ISO, 169 WRC plus last season against right-handed pitching. The only six players better, Acuna, Judge, Jordan Alvarez, Seager, Matt Olson, and Shohei Otani. That is the kind of company he is keeping. He is way too cheap on this slate. All right, gentlemen, way to keep it clean and fun and positive. Well done. Coming up, turns out, Scotty does know. The world's number one golfer going for history. Who has the best shot at preventing said history from going down? Jeff is standing by with his answer.
Sunday. But before Master Sunday comes Shell Houston Open Sunday. Scotty Scheffler trying to become the first player since Dustin Johnson in 2017 to win three consecutive PGA Tour starts. Let's dive into this. Let's go ahead and take an early peek at the Masters right now with gorgeous golf guru, Jeff Ulrich. We got five co-leaders after 54 holes, Jeff, which is the most in a PGA Tour event since six players shared the lead after the third round of the 2009 edition of the Houston Open. Those players, Paul Casey, Fred Couples, Colt Nose, Ryan Moore, Bo Van Pelt, and your boy, Jeff Ogilvy. All right, that's Jeff with a G. There's not many Jeff with the G's out there. But look at this leaderboard right now, Ulrich. Who's got the best shot at preventing Scotty from making history here? I mean, I, I'm going to go with my my guy. I mean, I, the guy I've, I've kind of bet and the guy I think is, is eventually going to break through and win on the PJ Tour at some point, Steven Yager. Oh, I knew it. Um, I knew it. He's, Producer Drew he's and I knew you were doing it. Corn Fa- uh, he's a five-time winner on the Corn Ferry Tour. Um, he's been in contention already once this year. He makes a ton of cuts. He's a very consistent player. He's got the upside with the around the green game and the putter that, you know, for, you know in a one-round scenario, um, can get really hot and, and potentially go low. I wouldn't count out, out Thomas Detry either, though, but Detry's still looking for his first professional win. Yager's also played well in this course before. That's where I would be looking. Uh, it is a really tight leaderboard, though. We've got Batia, one shot back, super talented. He can go low. Um, and they all have to beat Scotty Shuffler as well. You know, you got Finau at two shots back. So, so it's actually a pretty interesting final round. I know it's not star studded like people want, but I'm going to lean with uh, Steven Yager. I, I, I really feel like he can, uh, he can break through and, and this might be a shot. 34 year old German pro. He opened this tournament at plus 5,000 odds to win Jeff. He shot his second straight four under 66 after an opening round 69 Nice. Needs his first tour victory, searching for it in his 135th career start. In terms of props right now on the DK Sportsbook, which ones are you looking at here for this Sunday of the Houston Open? Yeah, I mean, you can be looking at the top 10 market. I mean, uh, Victor Perez is interesting at plus 300, but I'm going to go to the three balls here. Uh, I, I think that there's a, there's a pretty good value on a couple plays. Adam Svensson is plus 150 going up against uh, Cam Davis and Harry Hall. Svensson's hit the ball really well the last couple of weeks, gaining over five strokes on approach in this tournament. He, he gained on approach big time in the last tournament. Um, those other two players, I just don't think are playing near as well. And I think plus 150 is a really fair price. I think Kurt Kitayama plus 130 going up against Ryan Moore and Ben Silverman is also a pretty good price. Kitayama is a really quality player. Played well yesterday. I like both those guys in their three ball matchups. And if you want to bet Yager, you could also bet him in a three ball matchup against Scotty Scheffler and David Skins, who <laughs> again just shows up. I mean, I don't, David Skins, I'm not expecting much from him today, but Yager's plus 285. So it's another way to play Yager today if you're interested. But I like those first two, Kitty Ammon, Svensson, and three balls. Skins, the 42 year old Englishman, Jeff, he opened at plus 30,000 to win this thing. Yeah. And he's trying for his first PGA Tour title on his 37th Tour start. All these guys who are lesser-known names, who have yet to win on tour, going head-to-head with Scotty Scheffler, those guys are nervous as hell when they tee off today. We'll see if they have ice running through their veins. We know Scheffler, for crying out loud, has ice running through his veins. Again, looking to become the first player since Dustin Johnson six, seven years ago, went three straight tour events here. Man, that's a short number for him to win. Plus 140 here. If he does, how do you think it impacts his already short Masters odds? I mean, I guess they get shorter. I guess we see plus 350. I mean, I, I plus 300 by the time we tee off. I mean, they certainly aren't going to get longer. I mean, Scotty Scheffler has already moved from like, you know, plus 650 down to plus 400 just off of two wins, obviously beating the field at the at the players. So, you know, I, I was probably expecting Scotty Scheffler to get a little bit bigger in odds. You know, but not a whole lot. Maybe we see plus 500 again if he doesn't win. But, like, if he wins this event, you're not going to see anything shorter. So, you know, if you're betting Scotty Scheffler and, and looking to kind of just, you know, looking looking into the future and, and want a piece of him at the Masters, I mean, you know, like, this number potentially isn't going to get much bigger anyways. I mean, I think at worst, it'll probably get up to plus 500, like I said, yeah. and I don't even know if it'll reach that. He's going to be extremely popular bet at the Masters anyways. Yeah. Um. So, you know, taking a piece of him now if you want him is, is probably the right way to do it. 
it, it's it's I, I mean he's he's like you said he's he's oh he's almost plus one hundred to to close it out today so he's got a great chance to do that. If his odds stick to plus four hundred to win the Masters, which they are right now in the DK Sportsbook, Jeff, if that price remains, he'd be the shortest Masters favorite since Tiger Woods in 2013 when Big Cat was plus 350 here. And Scheffler, people forget, Jeff, had the ball striking he needed to contend at Augusta in 2023, had a lackluster putter that kind of bit him in the rear. It's been a different story, though, this year, Jeff, and we've seen it through the Arnold Palmer. We've seen it through the players. We're seeing it this week at Houston. That much improved flat stick here. Should we be sitting back and embracing more and enjoying more the golf that this guy's playing at this historic pace instead of wanting to compare him so bad to Tiger Woods. Yeah, no, absolutely enjoy the, the run Scotty Scheffler's on. I think what we've seen is that the run that these top players go on in this era, Dustin Johnson, Jason Day, when he was in top form, Brooks, Ke- Brooks Kepka as well. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, what, what I would say is that, um, like, you know, enjoy the run, but like you don't necessarily have to go out and bet Scotty Scheffler at plus four hundred. I would not be betting a favorite that short. Um, you know, at, at the Masters, we we've just re, we, you know when Dustin Johnson was this short, he didn't even get to start the Masters. Tiger in two thousand thirteen, uh, he didn't win either. So enjoy it, but I wouldn't necessarily be betting this guy at this number. Hey, Tony Finau, as we're looking ahead uh, to the Masters, everyone remembers this is uh, where Tony Finau like, broke his ankle. What was he celebrating? Maybe a hole in one during the part three contest. And then yes. ended up almost yes. uh, winning, was competing on like a fat, bruised, swollen, beefy ankle for four days here. Tony was the only guy who was over par in the top 20 in round three at Houston. He's still within striking distance. Also, there was a little bit of beef uh, between him and Alejandro Tosi. Did you see that yesterday? Their balls on the fourth green landed within a foot of each other, and there was some bickering and back and forth. Got a little heated to see which guy was away because obviously with the same line, the guy who was away yeah. has a – or the guy who was closer will have a very uh, beneficial line after seeing the first dude putt. But anywho, are you giving Tony any shot today? And then also what would your approach be with Tony at Augusta where he has flirted with the green jacket? I mean, uh, again, like people are probably going to be sick of hearing this. And I, I mean, I already put it out on Twitter and it got like a thousand likes because this is how sick wow, of people are weird betting flex. Tony Finau in a major. But, you know, Tony Finau plus 35. Hundred. I mean, I, I think it's a great bet at the Augusta. I really do. I mean, you look at the ball striking. Who who really in this range is going to like kind of rise up and match Scheffler in terms of ball striking? I mean, Finau can actually do that. He did. He's done it this week. Um, his around the green game is actually better than some of the players in this range. I would say he's better than Morikawa. Probably a better around the green player than Wyndham Clark. Does the putter ever show up for Tony for Tony Finau at Augusta? I mean, if it does, he's going to contend. He was he's been in a final group at Augusta. I think it's a good number. Um, as far as the first chances today, you mentioned the thing with Tosti. It's really interesting. I mean, these South American guys are pretty fiery, but yeah, you gotta you gotta really you you gotta work hard to get Tony Finau fired up, man. He's yeah. a pretty low key individual. I like it. I like that Finau's fired up. I don't think it's going to help him today, but I hope it helps him helps him in the future. That's that's my angle. Um, I do like Tony Fiedo at Augusta. I'll go out and say it for the fifth year in a row. Um, I don't think he's going to get it done today, though. I, I think one of those guys in, in the final group is probably going to do it. All right, Jeff, a little more than a minute to go here. We've seen how well Wyndham Clark has played this season. He's another guy I think people are kind of eyeing early on at Augusta, which, again, Master Sunday two weeks from now. I think he's around plus 2,800 or so. Will Zalatoris was flirting with the cut line. He's T61 this week. We've seen him flirt with a green jacket at Augusta. Which of those two dudes would you be more interested right now and maybe sprinkling something on when it comes to the Masters in two weeks? I mean, you know, Wyndham Clark in terms of the Masters, I mean, I I just, his number is bigger for a reason. Um, You know, he's he's been so good, but if, if he had had experience at Augusta, I mean, it would be a different story. But his around the green game can still be a little bit up and down. Like I mentioned him in this range with Finau, I mean, 
Um, certainly Wyndham Clark has played better than Finau, but he doesn't have the experience. And I think that affects him. If I was going to bet Wyndham Clark at a major, I would just bet him at the U.S. Open again. Yeah. Uh, I think he's going to have a great chance. He, he looks in great form, but I wouldn't bet him at this major. I'd rather go down to one of the live guys like Cameron Smith or Finau. And then you mentioned Will Zalatoris. Yep. Just a little bit too up and down for me. I, I, I just don't think that the game is quite back at the A level. It's certainly at a B level right now for him, but not quite there for me. I, I would I would bypass both those guys at Augusta, to be honest. All right, Jeff. Well, we will head into break by showing that incredible tweet you had, getting sucked in the fee now at Augusta in two weeks for the fifth year in a row. That really is you and fits your personality yes. perfectly. Julian's perfect personality will join us live next from Las Vegas to break down the Elite Eight.
folks, second hour of the sweats kicking off. We'll dive into the NBA coming up. But right now, let's go live to Las Vegas where Julian Edlow has left his hotel room for the first time in four days. Joining us live from our VSIN studios there in Sin City. Top of the morning, you look very fresh. How do you sound? I sound oh. like I've been uh, sick for three weeks and spent the last four days in Las Vegas. Voice can make you purr. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, thanks for leaving your yep. hotel room this morning. First two seats at the Final Four table, Julian Edlow, have been filled. I want to start with the game that went down here in our backyard in Boston. UConn just continuing to steamroll the competition, beating Illinois here using an absurd 30-0 run, a huge game by that 7-2 center, Donovan Klingon, who was a rare athlete for his size. They cruised to a 77-52 victory over Illinois. They've now run their streak, Julian, of NCAA tournament wins by 13 or more points to 10 in a row. What else can be said about the dominating Huskies right now that have has not already been said? Not much. I mean, Illinois did what they needed to do, got them into a rock fight in the first half. The refs were absolutely playing along, calling close to nothing. Um, and that game was 23 to 23. And then UConn goes into the locker room up five. And then, uh, you know, you start watching the second half and it's a 30 point game. They can go on these runs that nobody else can really go on. They have a gear that nobody else has. Uh, you talk like, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for, for somebody to tweet out the last time there was a 30 to nothing run in the tournament. It was probably 25 years ago in a one 16 game. You don't go on 30 to nothing runs in a one versus three game in the elite eight to go to the final four. Um, UConn's got a different level on both sides of, of the ball and Illinois, Illinois is a good team and they, they just did that to them. This is what UConn's doing to every team that's being put in front of them. And that's exactly why I was waiting when that second game ended. I was like, what in the world are we going to open this number at DK Sportsbook? 11 and a half was <laughs> the, the opener on that game. I, I'm not betting against UConn. I'm not taking Bama. Why? Come on, dude. I will say this, a potential. Because that seems like a waste of money when I'm sitting there <laughs> at the end of the game and UConn goes on another 30 nothing run. A potential head-to-head -head clash with Zach Eady in the national championship game would be must-see TV, would it not? I think Purdue's the only team left in the field that can beat UConn. And there were very few teams I would say that about to begin with. Auburn was one of them, and we got robbed of that Sweet 16 matchup in Boston. Um, you know, the game script for, for UConn to lose a game in this tournament is you get Purdue, Klingon gets like two early fouls in the first three minutes, Edie starts dominating, Purdue gets up by 10 points, and have to sustain a late push from UConn and hang on to win the game. Like, that's the game script for somebody in the field, that team being Purdue, to beat UConn. I don't see how anybody else does it. it the one thing Alabama could do if they shoot like they shot yesterday, which I think was 15 of 35 from three, yeah. that's a good start. Maybe they can cover. I don't think they're going to win. I mean, UConn looked like a cheat code once again, and then Illinois at times looked like they had forgotten how to play basketball. Like both can be true. And then Klingon, again, that rare size, yet he runs the floor like a freaking guard for crying out loud. How about the late game? Hot shooting Alabama. And their next opponent here was Clemson. So it has all the feels of a college football game when you hear these two teams. 89 to 82. The Tide Jewels knocking down 16 of 36 shots from beyond the arc. And then they got a huge performance off the bench from freshman Jaron Stevenson. What did you take away from that game last night? I already know you're not giving them a shot against UConn, but how impressed were you? by what the Tide did. Yeah, I mean, I, I took away that it was very frustrating to be sitting there with a Clemson plus three and a half ticket watching that game. Uh, Alabama shot 44% from deep. Clemson, a good shooting team, 
shot 50% from the free throw line in that game. Um, that, that's a credit to Alabama. They hit really tough shots, but Clemson wanted no part of that game. Uh, they, they just completely fell apart in the second half, showed a, a little heart for a couple stretches, and then would just let it go again, and Alabama would, would hit a big three. Clemson would come down and, and turn it over. Alabama's got a high ceiling. We know this. They have good athletes, and they can shoot the ball. So, like, they can have a stretch like Illinois had where they are in the game for a while, and you say, oh, wow, Alabama's in this game. But I promise UConn will also have that stretch. It's not going to be 30 to nothing, but they will have a stretch that kind of knocks Alabama out of that game. So how the hell can Alabama slow down this UConn juggernaut? Uh, well, it's an interesting way to phrase it because they might try and speed up this UConn juggernaut oh. because that's how they play. They're just going to run up and down and try and make a million threes and uh, hope that UConn goes cold. Get some fouls on Klingon, um, which will be tougher because... They're not going to play as much in the paint. They're going to be jacking up threes. So it's tough to see that happening. But they're going to they're gonna go the opposite way, speed it up, shoot threes, play like they did in the second half against Clemson, who is a slow-tempo team and, you know, grinds on the defensive end um, and, and try and win it in a different way. But, you know, uh, you, you see right there the, the stats through the, the tournament games, how many points Alabama is scoring. Problem is, look at that points allowed by UConn so are the Huskies going to be able to to grind Alabama down make them miss all the shots that they made against Clemson obviously I think so uh but Alabama has at least the weapons to to stay in the game does Tennessee have the weapons to put up a fight at all against Purdue today it feels like right now Jules no team not even like a red hot Zag squad the other night has provided much resistance to Purdue throughout this tournament with Zach Eady now firing literally on all cylinders. Yeah, uh, well, Ten Gonzaga was playing really well and Purdue smoked him, but Tennessee's a much tougher team and they're going to slow it down and they're going to play defense. They can absolutely make this a game with Purdue. Now, I bet Purdue minus two and a half at, at the opener. Um, and I see we, we were at three for a long time on DraftKings when the market was predominantly three and a half. Now I see we're three and a half at DraftKings. Um, I, I, I would still go with Purdue there. I think that I think this is going to be a good game. Um, you know, I think that uh, I think that Tennessee will, will hang in it for a good amount of time. They they get into scoring slumps, though. They survived their their clunker against Texas. They're not going to play that poor again. If they do, they'll, you know, they'll get mopped. But they're going to have a stretch like a San Diego State has in some of these tournament games. Um, you know, like Illinois had five minutes without any, any points uh, last night. They're going to have a, a poor stretch. And if Purdue can turn that into, you know, a 12 nothing run or something, Tennessee is going to have a really tough time sticking around. So, the the biggest difference I think with Purdue this year, you like Edie is Edie, impossible to stop at times. They have Purdue has three really good guards, and they're all very good shooters. And that guard play, uh, <clears throat> I think, is the difference in this year's team. And if those guards are shooting well in this game today, I think that's going to be the difference in this game. Okay, what could be the difference then when we talk Duke and NC State here, which? The Wolfpack have firmly cemented themselves as the Cinderella story of the tournament, which you don't really hear an ACC team quite often referred to as a Cinderella. And these two longtime conference foes and, and rivals have a long history together, even this season. What takeaways do you have from their previous meetings this season, and how can you apply that to your approach when attacking this game on the DK Sportsbook, Jules? Yeah, well, they obviously know each other well and have played plenty of times, which, uh, you know, I guess the, inclines me to, to take the points when you use that narrative. Um, but <clears throat> even forgetting, you know, how well the teams know each other, you just look at how well NC State is playing. Where was this all year is my question. Like, why are they so good right now? Because this isn't, uh, they're not winning like fluky games. Yes, Marquette was awful 
from downtown. They did not do themselves any favors, but NC State is terrific. Like defensively, they have guards, they have shooters, they have DJ Burns, who is, you know, a unique uh, player down in the post. I like taking seven with NC State. I think that they're, you know, the way that they're playing, how well they know the matchup, um, it, it's tough to see this game getting getting too out of hand. So we've been talking about NC State for a while. I've been telling you how I've been fading them. They're going to run out of gas. They can't sustain this. Well, I've lost enough money doing that, and I'm yeah. now going to switch to the other side and look really stupid if uh, now NC State does run out of gas and get yep. blown out. But, hey, got to pick a side. I think it's NC State. Because, Jules, here very quickly, we'll pack 11-6-1 ATS uh, as an underdog this year, and that includes six straight covers in that situation, dude. Well, yeah, I mean, that's just essentially the run that they're on right now, being priced as an underdog in all these tournament games and, and coming through. You look at them, they pass the eye test. They're playing really well, and they have, uh, you know, they have all the pieces to compete with Duke, and they know Duke very well. So I don't know if they'll get it outright, but seven seems to be too many points for me. All right, hang on. We'll talk game script for the remaining two final or elite eight games, rather, as they try to book their tickets to the final four coming up. Going to need you right after this break, too. Gary and Thorne standing by. We're going to look into the future here in the NBA and how green the Celtics are feeling right now. Maybe how nervous you are about your boys.
Folks, the NBA postseason is right around the corner, so there is no better time than now to look into our crystal balls and see the future on the hardwood with these two hardwood loving gentlemen. Gary and Thorne has returned. Julian Edlow has returned. As we look and see who sits atop the board here to win the NBA title, Celtics, Nuggets, Bucks, Clippers, Suns, Thunder here as well. Those odds have moved throughout the season, obviously. But right now, when we're talking top dogs, Celtics the favorites. But Jules, you know better than anybody being a Celtics hardo. They've struggled a little bit recently after that nine-game win streak. They've had a tough time winning close games. How do you feel about possibly fading them in the futures market here? Their kryptonite right now appears to be the Atlanta Hawks. Yeah, I, I don't care much about the the recent struggles because I don't know. At some point, they were going to lose focus for a moment. Like they were eleven games up in the East, they clinched the one seed. Like it, it uh, there's only so long you can you can keep all and maintain all of your focus. But they bounced back with a solid win in in New Orleans yesterday. Um, but the late game struggles are are real. That is for real. I don't. It, it's maddening to watch for the last two and a half plus years. I don't know why they cannot figure out playing in in crunch time. They can they can win a series against a bad team in the East, blowing out three of the games and maybe win one close game. Like I'm not too worried about them early in the process. It's it's later in the process. So I'll be stunned if the Celtics don't win the East. I think there's still a good bet to win the East, but there are some teams out West that concern me very much, primarily Denver, who I think is the worst matchup for the Celtics that, uh, you know, the Celtics will be heavily favored in that series, but I, I would like, you know, Denver, unfortunately in a, in an NBA final scenario. So I think they're going to get there. What they do there, we'll see what they learned in 2022 against the Warriors, uh, but what they do there, I would be much more concerned about in the finals. How about, Gary, and in your unbiased opinion, since you are outside Boston, any cause for concerns here with the Celtics? And do you believe there's any other team in the East that can prevent them from reaching the NBA final? Because so many people believe, as Julian just said, they'll get there, and their biggest threat to not raise their latest banner into the rafters will come from the West. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm unbiased. I hate the Celtics. There he is. Um, but, there we, uh, I, I was waiting for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, there is no metric I could possibly pull out that suggests the Celtics aren't not just the best team in the Eastern Conference, but a historically great team. So it's really hard to build an argument against them. I would just say that generally speaking, when talking from a betting perspective, I don't have a lot of interest in betting a plus 200 favorite in a future. It's just not overly appealing. Um, and also the way the Eastern conference is falling right now is a little interesting. You know, you've got Philadelphia is sort of like a fake eight seed. I mean, obviously the Celtics have a very rich history of absolutely killing the 76ers in the playoffs. But if you are to believe, you know, Nick nurse and, and the management structure in Philadelphia, Joel Embiid should be back for a playoff series. How much of a ramp up we get to that? I don't know, but there is a scenario where the Celtics would have essentially have to play Philadelphia in the first round, the Knicks in the second round and the Bucks in the third round, which if we were starting things out, you know, three, four months ago, talking about how you project the playoffs, that's probably the worst case scenario a Celtics fan or a Celtics backer could build. So I think they're favored in all three of those series. I think they probably win all three of those series, but it is a bit of a tougher path than maybe they had to go through last year where, you know, they played the Hawks in the first round and essentially you're just waiting for the second round to start. So things could set up a little difficult, but I would still say, aside from the Nuggets, there's absolutely no one that you can really build a statistical argument for aside from the Celtics. All right, Gary, so no interest in betting the Celtics there uh, in the East at that number, but what about in the Western Conference? There's still a great race, not only for the number one seed there, but you could dive into the Northwest winner. Nuggets, the favorites currently, despite being a half game back. Wolves and Thunder are sitting at 185 to win the Northwest, 
Timberwolves plus 185, Thunder plus 300 here. Well, how much interest do you have in potentially attacking this division winner market on the DK Sportsbook? Yeah, division winner market, if you want to go Western Conference winner. Again, the fact that the Nuggets are heralded in the way they are, justifiably so, is really giving some interesting numbers for teams that could be the number one seed in this conference. And, you know, we give the Nuggets all the acclaim in the world for how fantastic they have been as a home team so far this season and in seasons past. I think it's worth pointing out how good the Thunder and the Timberwolves have also been at home this season. So that number one seed has massive implications in the playoffs for home court advantage in some of these later rounds. And really, there's a game on April 10th that is going to be kind of for everything. It's the Nuggets at Minnesota with one game left in the season for each of those teams. Maybe it means nothing by that point, but I think it's going to mean a lot. And I'm just starting to buy into the Timberwolves. I'm convincing myself. Maybe I'm a fool. Um, but, you know, we talk about things that play in the playoffs. Great defensive teams. And the Timberwolves have far and away the best defensive rating in all of basketball. They've got veteran players who have been there before. Anthony Edwards is not only obviously becoming that guy, but this will be his third go around in the playoffs. I, I, I think he's just reaching a point where if he exploded and became... I don't want to say a superstar. He's already a superstar. But if he took another half step up and became that guy in the playoffs, I don't think anyone would be surprised. And the Timberwolves have also just played sort of playoff style basketball the entire season. They've been a low pace team. Again, just grinding out these defensive wins. If they can get that number one seed, and I think that maybe they can just because, you know, you look at the Nuggets right now, Jamal Murray's not playing. They're kind of nursing an injury with him. They don't care. They don't want the one seed. They don't need it. I think the Timberwolves are hungrier. I think they're going to go after it. I like them to win the division, and I like their number to win the conference as well. It's just massive when you consider how good they've been all season long. Well, speaking of numbers to win the conference, I mean, you currently have the Thunder you know, tied for first place here in the West, Julian, and you could get the Thunder to win the West at plus 800, and then you go back to that Northwest division, plus 300. What, what argument could you make right now to bet the Thunder to win either one of those? Yeah, I mean, OKC has been fantastic all season long, but like Gary just broke down how the Wolves have kind of made this this climb over the last few years of kind of inserting themselves in a legitimate playoff team. OKC hasn't made that climb yet. They're going to be in this year and uh, kind of have their learning lesson. Uh, you know, that's just usually how this stuff works. So they're a very good team. I would much rather, you see, you know, OKC there at 8-1 to one or Minnesota at 10-1. to one. I'm totally aligned with Gary in there. I would much rather take a Minnesota 10-1 to one to win the West ticket um, with the way that they play, um, you know, the rising star that they have. Not that SGA isn't awesome, um, but, you know, to have Edwards and then the pieces that Minnesota has around him, they're just built better to have a chance. Um and I, I think if you have a Minnesota 10 to 1 ticket to win the West in pocket, they probably make a little run and you're at least going to be in a good position to buy off if you ultimately say, you know, they made it here, but hey, Denver's probably going to get them. Y you'll have a chance to, to do that. But, uh, you know, I think Denver's going to win the West. But if you start looking down the board, there's been times in the season that you can talk yourself into a lot of teams, the Clippers included, who are sitting there at plus 340. Um, but, as we're getting closer and closer, I'm sifting out more and more teams, and I'm like, Minnesota at 10 to 1 is probably the one beyond Denver that I have the most interest in. Well, before we go to break, Gary, and I want to hit on this real quick because opposite end of the playoff picture here, an interesting one Warriors heavily favored to be in the play in tournament, minus 2,000. Now, that's mainly because they have no shot at landing that sixth seed. But they are just one game up on the Red Hot Rockets, who are plus 450 in this department. Would you consider that good value right now? I mean, it's not bad. Um, and obviously, again, just like we had with the Nuggets and Timberwolves, there's a massive game coming up between these two teams. It's in Houston, so that does sort of favor Houston when you start projecting these things out. But the Rockets have a really difficult schedule down the stretch. They've got the Mavericks twice. They've got the T-Wolves. They've got the Clippers. That is the last day of the regular season, so maybe that game doesn't mean anything at that point. The Suns. Whereas the Warriors have a significantly easier schedule. Uh, the Warriors have more home games and road games in this little stretch. And also Golden State, I, I know there's this perception that they're like blowing it. I think this is mostly just the Rockets playing out of their minds. Like Golden State's been fine in March. They're eight and seven. They've got a positive net rating. I think they probably hold on. But 
Plus, 450 is pretty tantalizing. And if the Rockets win that game on April 4th, that number is not going to be nearly as good. All right, Jules, very quickly here. What do you think about the Rockets in this department? I'll give you 15 seconds. Uh, yeah, I mean, Houston, Houston's playing really well. They're making up a ton of ground. And like Garyan said, it's about what they're doing in, in Houston. If you're going to win all your games, uh, then you're, you're going to make up ground. Like Golden State's not going to be perfect. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement. Okay, we got two more seats at the Final Four table that need butts in them. And said butts will be booked later today. Who will be cutting down the nets? Who will be tickling the twine? Julian, hang out. We need to talk some game script for the final two Elite Eight games.
back here on The Sweat, everybody. Julian is back on the big screen, joining us live from our v studios in Las Vegas. Let's get after it a little more about these two Elite Eight games today. Let's start with Duke and NC State, my friend. So the line right now on the DK Sportsbook, you've got Duke as a seven-point favorite here. Now, even with Jamal Sheed's sideline for the entire second half, in the Sweet 16, Jules, Duke could not separate itself from Houston substantially in that three-point victory. So is this line a little scary for you, especially with Duke losing to NC State a couple weeks ago by a five-point margin? Yeah, and I, I don't even care that much about the, you know, the recent head-to-head -head matchup that NC State won. Duke's a good team. We, but, you know, we can't take away that they've gotten very fortunate in their path here. Um, you got to beat who's in front of you, but, you know, you, you take down two double-digit seeds to, to get to the Sweet 16. And then in the Sweet 16, the team you're playing's best player, the Big 12 player of the year, uh, you know, Houston's everything, rolls his ankle and he's done for the game. So, you, you know, you, gotta, you get to play them in the second half without... Uh, the guy that makes everything work for Houston. So it, it can be two things. Duke can be very good, but they also have gotten an extremely fortunate path that I think needs to be discussed. Whereas NC State is just uh, beating pretty good teams along, along the way, highlighted by Marquette. And Marquette, again, did themselves no favors. They were the complete opposite of what Alabama did yesterday, knocking down all their threes just missing all their threes in, in that game against NC State. But, um, yeah, I think th this is going to be by far Duke's toughest test of the tournament, which sounds silly when you go from playing Houston to NC State, but that's just the way it is right now. I, 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 like, uh, I like the way that uh, NC State is playing. I don't know where this was all year from the Wolfpack, but certainly give me seven points in a rivalry game where these two teams – know each other very well. All right, let's have some fun. Let's talk game script here then. NC State. I don't like fun. Well, we know that. We can tell by your constant monotone tone. NC State wins if... NC State wins if they play good defense and Duke misses their threes. If Duke yeah. makes their threes like they did in that James Madison game then they're they're going to win. We'll see if it's by more than seven or not. Um, NC State's gotten a little lucky, like their three-point defense, their free throw defense. They magically make teams miss free throws. Like at some point, this stuff runs out. Um, but again, Duke's been lucky too, and they've been making their shots against not as good teams. Uh, I don't think they played that great against Houston, but they could they could afford to not play great and win that game because of the shed injury. So, again, I, I if if Duke isn't hot from three, that's going to really open the door for the Wolfpack here. Yeah, I think you may be onto something with the threes. Plus, you maybe want to throw in some offensive rebounding. How huge that would be for NC State to win this thing because Duke buried nine threes and snatched seventeen of its misses in a February win over NC State but only tallied five threes and ten offensive boards when the pack upset the Blue Devils in the ACC tournament. So, good for you. Sounding like you're making sense. Game props, oh, player props, anything with this game that you'd like to bring to the attention of the people watching right now before we go to Tennessee-Purdue? Yeah, uh, I, like, if I, went to, if I went to player props, again, and again, I... I Lost on Clemson first half and Clemson full game oh. yesterday. But what I, what I did win in that game was the race to 20 points with Clemson. They came out hot. I think if you like NC State in this game, looking at them, you know, race to 10 points, race to 20 points, I think they start the game on their terms, whether it gets away from them or, or not late. Um, so I don't mind going to, uh, going to the race to 10 or 20 points and getting some good plus money. Uh, with the Wolf Pack, and then kind of to your point, Emerson, how important rebounding can be, keeping Duke off the offensive glass for those second chance points. Um, DJ Burns 
is four and a half rebounds in this game. Yeah. That feels pretty low for me for uh, the big fella, and you're getting plus money there. Um, I think he's going to have to play a role on, on the glass to keep NC State in this one, so I like that prop. So we have the Boilermakers. We know Edie is playing like a man possessed right now as we go to the second Elite Eight game of the day, Jules. They're going to continue their march to the Final Four talk in Purdue against the Volunteers and a team that is really lights out defensively. You mentioned their defense in a previous segment already in this show, but do they have enough juice to keep pace on offense with Purdue? Yeah, I, they can for a period of time. I ultimately don't think they they will, which is why I'm on Purdue in this game. Um, surprised me a little bit looking into the numbers, like going into the tournament. You think of uh, <clears throat> Tennessee as, as such a slow-paced team. They rank 79th in tempo. They're, they're not playing that slow, and they're 29th in terms of offensive efficiency. So... They can push the pace and score a little bit. Obviously, their calling card is uh, defensive efficiency, where they were ranked third coming into the the tournament in the country. Um, you look at Purdue, obviously the high-powered offense. They're third in offensive efficiency, but the tempo, they're, they're 175th in tempo. Um, you know, if Tennessee is pushing the pace a little bit and Purdue's trying to slow it down, that's kind of the opposite, I think, of the perception of how we we think of this game. Um, so, you know, ultimately, I do think Purdue gets enough stops and exposes enough holes offensively on Tennessee to get through in this game. But there's certainly a, a script where Tennessee pushes the pace a little bit um, and has things going their way for, for periods of this game. So I was about to ask you about the script. Tennessee wins if, and it appears that you think it's really just the pace that will come down to that, or maybe the supporting cast there on, on the bench, because in that Sweet 16 victory, what was that over Creighton? It was the other guys who really helped Tennessee win that game. Yeah, there's a couple ways to answer this one. Tennessee wins if Zach Eady gets into foul trouble. That helps. Tennessee wins if... That excellent trio of Purdue guards isn't making their three pointers. Um, but ultimately, Tennessee's going to need a little bit of offense here, uh, too. So they're going to need to not shoot anywhere close to the clunker that they had against the Longhorns and were able to survive and advance in that second round game. So there's a few ifs here for Tennessee, but none of them are none of them are that wild. Like they they, you know they certainly could come to fruition. So I think Tennessee is going to have a shot in this game. I think it's going to be a good game. I don't think Purdue just dominates the full game. But I do like them to pull away late and win by more than a possession, laying those three and a half points. And Purdue definitely wins if Braden Smith continues his surge here, right? Because in addition to the Boilermakers' excellent long-range shooting here, you had Smith, Jules, Looking at his numbers now, he racked up 14 points and 15 assists in that Sweet 16 victory. And then you had four Purdue players bearing a pair of triples. And you know this being a huge basketball guy. There are a few things that could be more devastating to a defense, even a defense as good as Tennessee, than it seems like everyone is hitting threes. Yeah, I mean, that's just why I think the trio of uh, Purdue guards is so important. Um, Braden Smith... Fletcher Lawyer, Lance Jones, like those three guys all have point props between nine and a half and 11 and a half. They can all make their threes. They can all handle the ball. Like that's ultimately, obviously Edie having a good game is important to the script for Purdue. But ultimately those three guards playing well, making their shots, more specifically making their threes, that's going to be the key uh, to this game. In Tennessee, those guards... Um, specifically Ziegler, very good defensively. So, like, they'll give some issues at times the same way that they gave issues to a really good trio of Creighton guards in that last game. Um, but ultimately, I think, you know, Purdue is almost just a better version of Creighton. They have three three really good guards, and then Edie, obviously better than Kalkbrenner, the big man in the middle, for the Blue Jays. So I think that this is just kind of a bigger, badder Creighton team 
that matches up well with Tennessee. All right, very quickly, any other game bets or uh, props that you'd like to push out here before we get a break? Um, maybe some of those Purdue guards that I keep mentioning on okay. the three-point props, but they're all set at one and a half with pretty good plus money to the over. Um, I think those guys should knock down some threes. All right, good stuff, Jules. I need you to hang out. we got to take our final break of I'll the show. Out. I know you will. I know you will. We're going to start the next segment with you because we need to see which teams that you are giving a Final Four and championship game edge to. Plus, Steve Buchanan will finally return in this block. He'll sit next to me, and we will talk wow. some baseball bets to wrap up the show. But, yes, college basketball championship futures are first.
Final block here of a Sunday morning edition of The Sweat, everybody. It's good to have you here. I'm Emerson Latsia. Hey, Steve Buchanan. I'll get to you in just a moment. But Thanks. first, got to hit up Julian Edlow before he takes off in our VEASAN studios live right now in Las Vegas. We've broken down the Elite Eight games today, Jules. So I want to focus a little bit more right now on the futures market. And in terms of championship odds... UConn, not really sure if I'd want to hop on that minus 205 right now, but how about when you go to the reach the final tab on the DK Sportsbook, and if you truly feel that Purdue is just this well-oiled machine right now, plus 145 to reach the championship game, Duke plus 200, Tennessee plus 290, NC State plus 950 here. Which of those odds stand out to you? Could be a good time to hop on Purdue because that number will likely disappear if they win today. Well, and not likely, yeah. If they <laughs> win today, they're going to be a big favorite over an ACC team in the Final Four. That was really genius analysis by you, Emerson. I Thanks, should really man. just let you uh, handle this. Yeah, obviously too late to hop on the, uh, the UConn train if you have not already. So I like Purdue to reach the final at plus 145. You're essentially just betting a two-game money line parlay rather than, you know, laying three and a half points today or doing both. Um, I think the Tennessee game, the, the harder test is today against Tennessee. And then whether you get NC State or Duke, obviously you'd be a much bigger favorite over NC State. But you get one of those teams in the Final Four if you get through today and you're sitting on a very nice plus 145 on Purdue, who is a, a big favorite in that game. Uh, so if you like Purdue today like I do and you want to kind of get ahead of, of the next game that you're going to like them in, plus 145 looks pretty good to reach the final. It feels like we're on that UConn-Purdue collision course. Would you consider Purdue right now plus 400 to win it all just in case they end up getting paired up, which, again, would be must-see TV between Purdue and UConn? I'm not getting in the way of UConn right now. Yeah. So I understand much better odds to win one more game, uh, but then you're going to need to beat UConn unless Alabama pulls an absolute stunner. Uh, so I, I can't get on board with it. I just want Purdue to win two games, plus 145, see you in the final. Okay, one more for you. NCAA finalists here, though. If you are confident in UConn and Purdue being the last two standing playing each other, that's plus 180 right now in the DK Sportsbook. That's pl Okay, so that's yeah. a better bet. There you go. Um, Huh. Because you're essentially just adding UConn to beat Alabama yep. uh, into your two-game Purdue money line parlay. Um, I'm a lot more confident in UConn getting there than Purdue. So if you're going to go from plus 145 to plus 180 to just toss UConn in, might as well go ahead. All right. Your job here is done. Are you doing anything the rest of the day here on our network? I'm hanging out here. You guys think I do nothing. I'm sticking around. I'm sure. doing the Lombardi line. Um, you know, I got, I got work to do. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Right. Taking a dip in the pool later. Yeah. All right. You well, Steve just took like potatoes. an hour off. <laughs> hey buddy, you've taken like four weeks off. Right. Let's relax. All right. Buddy. Knock it off. Yeah, we'll see you, you later. Others would be, others would oh, be stop. impressed working through illness like that. You know, illness. You know what the best part is going to be? It's going to be like in two weeks when he has like one segment for the entire summer a day and then he'll have nothing to say. I know. He has been complaining already about what everything's going to look like after basketball season. It's like, dude. Too bad. Figure it out. Right. Do your job. Right now, we need you to do your job okay. as we retouch on some MLB bets. So right now, for this first Sunday of the MLB season, I ask you, your favorite bet overall on today's slate, and you say... Yeah, I think it's going to be that Dodgers team total over four and a half runs, getting that at minus 125. I mean, this this offense has just been an absolute juggernaut through the first five games of the season that they've played. They've already averaged 6.8 runs per game, haven't scored less than five runs in any of those games that they've played here. And that bullpen for the Cardinals has already been taxed already. They've covered 12 and two-thirds innings in this series so far this season. They're going with Steven 
Stephen Matz on the mound here today who should have a tough time against this Dodgers club. Even though the Dodgers have a lot of lefties in that lineup, they have a lot of lefties that also hit lefties well. I mean, you look at some of these guys like, you know, Freddie Freeman can hit lefties well, and then some of the righties that can hit lefties well. You got Mookie Betts, who's already hit four home runs, and I think knocked in ten runs already so far this season. You got Will Smith, you got Teoscar Hernandez, who was with the Mariners last year, and now is hitting six for the Dodgers. Like, this is a very tough team to get outs on, and we've seen that in two <laughs> times already uh, in this series. But yeah, I think the Dodgers go over that team total of four and a half runs. I will say, credit to Gary and Thorne, has me on Atlanta to go over four and a half runs here today against Ranger Suarez of the Phillies as well. That's why we bring Gary and on, because he is Canadian and knows his stuff. It is wild when I look at the division winners on um, the DraftKings Sports Hick. Sportsbook for Major League Baseball. Largest gap by far. Dodgers minus 400 to win the NL West. Um, and then the Diamondbacks at plus 700. So largest gap yeah. by far in all of these divisions between the team favored and then the next team after. And before the season even began, before they even started that in South Korea, I think it was minus 220. So we've nearly almost doubled that in just five games. And that's with the Diamondbacks playing well. As well, if I'm not mistaken, I think the Diamondbacks are in first place over the Dodgers right now just because of the win percentage. Yep. Like, yes, they played less games, only three games so far, but the Dodgers um, have the you know smaller winning percentage because they played more games. So even with the Diamondbacks in first place right now, still just a massive gap between those two teams. And we were in the betters box at the start of this show, but maybe for any folks who are just waking up, getting dialed in for the rest of the programming on DK Network and VSIN on this fine Easter Sunday, some other bets that catch your eye right now in the DK Sportsbook. What do you got? Yeah, I like taking the Rangers on the money line here, going up against the Cubs. Uh, the Rangers taking on Jordan Wicks, a left-hander that's going to go against this club. This is a very good offense against lefties. This is not a team you want to be facing if you're a left-handed pitcher. 341 Woba, 150 15 WRC plus was this Rangers team last year against lefties. And remember, this is essentially the same team that we saw last year, with the exception of someone like Wyatt Langford, who's in the lineup, who obviously is someone who's one of the favorites to win rookie of the year after that huge spring training that he had. Uh, Wicks has not seen his strikeout numbers translate over to the majors. We've only seen him play seven games last year, but in the minors, he was averaging about 10K9, you know, just over nine. Last season when he was in here, he was only at 6.2K9. So he's a Lefty, that's inducing a lot of contact. You don't not to do that against a Rangers team. That is a recipe for disaster here. For the Rangers, they got John Gray taking them out here against the Cubs. Cubs offense, obviously very early, really struggling out of the gate. I think they've only scored five runs so far in the regular season. John Gray had a really, really bad month of September. Kind of skewed his overall numbers to look a lot worse than they actually were. But he's a very serviceable number three in this Rangers uh, rotation. So I like the Rangers on the money line. Minus 135 against those Cubs. We touched on it briefly in this show already, but this <clears throat> Mets and Brewers series to open the year has provided some fireworks, a little bit of spiciness yeah. as well to it because it was Jeff McNeil who was not a huge fan of Reese Hoskins' hard slide on opening day. Reese Hoskins, who's now playing for the Brewers after six seasons with the Phillies and apparently has not let go of that NL East rivalry with the Mets Bukes. And then what does he do yesterday? He ends up driving in four runs as the Brewers top the Mets here. Yep. Either just your opinion on the spiciness of this early season series, opening season series, or maybe even a bet that would stand out you today. So you know what's hilarious about this, too? I don't know how good this is going to come in. Can you get in here, Eamon? This get is in there, Jeff Eamon. McNeil last year trying to break up a double play. Are you kidding me? Look at how far off he is from the base here. He's not even close. He's not even close. He's like going in and hitting Von Grissom in, in between the legs there is what it looks like. So he's getting all mad about Reese Hoskins doing a very legal slide, and then you have that from last year where McNeil is not even close to the bag. Yeah. Like, perfectly legal slide. I don't know what was up McNeil's you-know-what in that game, but, like, there was nothing wrong with what Reese Hoskins did, that slide that he did. Absolutely nothing wrong with that slide. I have nothing wrong, or, 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 or don't disagree no, with no, Hoskins No beef at with all. it. It's just funny that two games into his tenure with Milwaukee, Hoskins is still frustrating the Mets, similar to various points in his time with the Phillies here, which to me just says once again and backs up a claim I've, I've made on the show before. That's one of the best rivalries, if not the best rivalry in baseball 
right now is Philly's Mets. If you had over one and a half temper tantrums for Jeff McNeil for the season, you're sitting pretty because you already got one on the year. This is like, what, 159 games left on the season? You're going to be catching the over on the temper tantrums from Mr. McNeil. <laughs> And his little, you know, oh, you can't slide into I love like it, that. though. I think it's good for baseball. These guys getting fired up. Guys slowly walking out of the bullpen in the outfield. Yep. And then guys just trotting out of the dugout. And, and we had a little benches clearing thing with the Rays and, and Blue Jays a couple days uh, yesterday. Yeah. It, it was nothing like the Brewers and Mets, but, like, tempers are flaring that, early in the season. That, Kevin Kiermaier, right, is playing for the Jays now. You Kevin should... Kiermaier is now is back with the Jays. Yeah, I that, believe it is. But, yeah, yeah that, that's what it was. Why would you bring up Kevin Kiermaier? Just because I'm saying maybe they're just, you know, the, the Rays are pissed that Kevin oh. Kiermaier is, is now at the Blue Jays. I don't think that's a huge loss. There. I don't think that's a huge loss. That is, um, He's good that's a narrative but that's street. About it. Trip down narrative street that that's I'm going to actually reverse on right now. Uh, folks, thanks for hanging out with us all weekend long. We're back here live on DK Network and Visa next Saturday morning. 8 o'clock Eastern time. We'll see you then. Happy Easter.